You're listening to Neo Cash Radio, where we discuss the future of money today. In the studio with you, it's JJ, Darren, and Pedro. Can Rootstock save Bitcoin? The Poliniex Pump House. Ethereum's transaction volume is catching up to Bitcoin. All this and more here on episode 207, May 17th, 2017. In the traditional markets, we have gold up to $1,260, silver's up to $16.86, oil is up to $48.99, and the Dow is down to 20,641 points, and the 30-year Treasury yield has dropped to 2.906%. Excellent. In the Bitcoin market, Bitcoin is up over $1,820, Litecoin is down severely from last week to $24.04. Ethereum is up to $89.05. Dash is down to $82.87. Zcash is down to $91.81. And Monero is down to $27.80. Just a reminder that you can tune into Neocache Radio every Wednesday night. Don't want to miss a single moment of awesome Neocache content, including special episodes and bonus interviews. Subscribe to our podcast on Google Play Music, iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, YouTube Podcast Addict, and more. So uh, just... As the title of the show, the tease of the show said, can Rootstock save Bitcoin? So this is the first time we're talking about Rootstock here on Neocash Radio. You'll find a link to the, the, their website on our blog, neocashradio.com. Rootstock, or RSK, is a sidechain that will bring smart contracts to Bitcoin. In fact, Rootstock is also compatible with Solidity, and contracts that are on the Ethereum blockchain can be run in Rootstock. So what is Rootstock? Well, Rootstock is going to be a set two-way peg from Bitcoin and back to Bitcoin. So it's a sidechain that is going to run in parity and concurrently with Bitcoin. And the the people who want to use Rootstock will send Bitcoin from the, the main Bitcoin chain into a Rootstock child chain uh, smart contract of some sort. And then... That that they will then get a pegged amount of RSK tokens or coins, whatever they are called, and then they can use those as bitcoins. Essentially, I mean they're pegged two ways. So from that standpoint, they should be the same value as Bitcoin, right? Or a little bit less, as as it's a little harder to use in Bitcoin, maybe. Right. There's an extra step. So what what is the goal? Well, the goal is basically creating a network. Um, sidechain add-on that will intre- increase transaction throughput, but also bring the Turing complete computer that is part of the Ethereum virtual machine. So rootstock blocks will be mined at 10 second interviews, and they're planning on scaling up to 100 transactions per second. Now the mine the blocks are mined through merge mining, so they're planning on merging, I imagine, Bitcoin mining and rootstock mining together, and then the miners who create a rootstock block will get a, a payout in rootstock. Hmm. So I don't know how how that exactly or or how they they that works because they the point is is that there will never be more than 21 million rootstock even if bitcoin changes their code and goes above 21 million. So there's a way of 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 looking at it of of creating rootstock the moment that bitcoins are sent there or you have the whole supply in a locked account and you just unlock what you need as Bitcoins are sent. You know, there's a variety of different ways of handling it and they have a, a detailed explanation of what they've chosen and why they've chosen it and that sort of stuff. And I really encourage you to look at it. Does this require the cooperation of Bitcoin Core? I don't think so. So they can... So I mean, you, they don't, can, you don't need to change the Bitcoin nodes. You would just run rootstock nodes then that's right so you you basically uh they're they're, they have a test net going right now turmeric is their test net and it was just launched and it's basically a lot of people who are testing it out partners affiliates and associates whatnot and in about a month they're planning on launching the main net so i i this i believe this is an opt-in type of situation where you don't have to change bitcoin code at all you just have to figure out how you're going to handle the transaction between sending a Bitcoin payment or Bitcoin amount to the rootstock sidechain and what happens with that Bitcoin. But that, that's, that's been handled a million times by, by Ethereum and tokens and all kinds of different smart contracts. Once, once you have a smart contract sort of situation, um, like imagine the Dash masternode, right? How mm-hmm. do you, you know, what do you do with it? Well, it just locks it up. It basically, it's still sitting there, but as soon as you move it, you violated the, the terms of this, this contract and, you're at the back of the line. Right, or you're off the line. Right. Until, so, until it cuts back. 
Well, it can't happen soon enough as the mempool is still hovering around 100 million bytes or about 100 blocks. And the transactions waiting to be added to blocks are over 170,000. At one point this past week, uh, I saw uh, somewhere on Reddit that it was over. It hit, it hit the 200,000 mark. Now, I haven't seen a chart that uh, describes that, but uh, these charts aren't in very fine detail that I'm looking at. Um, moving on, well, Bitcoin related, Bitcoin market dominance has fallen. For the first time in crypto history, less Bitcoin is being traded across exchanges than altcoins and tokens. A big reason for this has been the rise of Ripple, which just a couple months ago has gone from less than a cent to over 30 cents per Ripple. Ethereum tokens are another large contributor as well. Gnosis recently had their token generation event, and they're adding over $133 million to the the market cap of non-Bitcoin dominance. That's just one example. Right. So there are numerous tokens where you know, uh, double-digit millions of dollars of, of market cap, even triple-digit. So the uh, the rise of Ripple, though, this has mystified us to a degree because we're, we're sitting here discussing Ripple, which is not a blockchain, which is not a cryptocurrency. It is a private ledger held by the Ripple Foundation and Corporation, whatever they, that, that, that is. Yeah, they, they, you can run a node, and they have some type of consensus, but it's not what uh, satoshi did right it's basically from what i've read it's it's interbank transfers so one bank transferring money to another bank can be done it's through the ripple network then saving time and energy versus the, the wire transfer type but but is it being used i don't i don't know i mean i've had it, friends that have used it i mean years ago i talked to somebody that used it and uh, it sounded like he was talking about small amounts of money. Um, yeah. Well, but, I mean, when they're worth less than a cent. But but we're talking about like a, a fifteen billion dollar market cap at current you know, prices, and, and I don't see the value I, there. I, I, I think it's misleading though, because mo- the Ripple Foundation uh, holds more than sixty five percent of those coins. They're not in circulation. Right. For the Ripples, whatever. You know, so it's like your market cap. Should should be you know a third of what it is, right? This, this, right. This smells like a pump and dump. Well, speaking of pump and dump, moving on to our next story, the Polynix pump house is driving market caps to new levels. Now, related to the last story here, if you've been watching crypto prices over the last few few weeks, you may have noticed several coins and tokens making huge gains upwards of a hundred percent or more in less than twenty four hours. I've been studying this more closely, and one of the things I first do is click through the currency and view which exchanges the action is coming from. More often than not, the price rise is attributed to Plunix alone with a massive spike in volume. These price rises seem to feed into the fear of missing out mentality and causes late movers to pick up the currency after it has already risen tremendously, only only to see it fall by 50% or more the next day. These late movers end up buying the dump after the the teams of traders have fleeced what they can. Well... Polynix and Kraken have been under in- intermittent DDoS attacks, and on top of this, Polynix is claiming the number of active daily traders has risen by more than 600%. Wow. Some unhappy traders have made accusations against Polynix for market manipulation. In fact, a law firm is investigating the possibility of a class action lawsuit. Between DDoS attacks, massive leg spikes, and pump and dump mentality, traders beware. That's probably a very good article there. JJ, I'm glad you looked that up. And, yeah. And well, I wrote that. It. Yeah, investigated that. Yes. Um, so, yeah, it, this is it, my first instinct is oh, a nice price rise, what markets are doing it. Now, what I've seen is a lot of politics leading the charge. Kraken is usually not that far behind, but they don't have nearly the volume. And, and, and in those cases, you will more often than not see that sharp decline either later that day or the next day mm-hmm. because the price was just it was too higher that no one wanted to actually pay that much for that that token or coin so this is happening a lot with the very cheap tokens and coins right we're talking about coins that are, are less than a cent yeah you know coins you measure in in, in millibits or, or satoshis. satoshis yeah right because they don't have a lot of market depth so it's easy for big whales to manipulate you know price to try to get a rally going when a coin is all only worth you know a couple million dollars, and somebody is holding you know three four hundred thousand dollars worth of that coin, well, you can start to make some manipulations. 
Yeah, and and especially with the the sheer number, a lot of these low low uh, priced coins are coins that are one of a billion, so to speak, you know, or mm-hmm. multiple billions. So when when a trader can go in and and snatch up a million coins for you know three hundred dollars worth of of currency, like yeah, they're gonna pump that up, and they're gonna make a lot of money off of it. And right. So and 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 that's why you know for people out there that do speculative investing, which we don't recommend here on Neocash Radio. But if you do that, uh, please do research. Yes. You know, I, I mean, is, is it appealing to see these coins do, you know, triple-digit rises in a week or so and, and people make money? Well, sure, that that's great if that's you. But if there's no underlining value, then, you know, it, it is a very risky uh, speculation. My thought always is if I was an investor in these altcoins, I would look for the ones that have fundamentals that... They might not rally as they might not rise as quick, but they're going to be more sustained because right. there's real value there. Like, so basically, you 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 classify it as sort of a value investor. You're looking at the long term value of of this over a certain uh, a certain length of time versus flipping it the same day, like by picking it up at lunch and then trying to flip it by dinner time. It, it's just different strategies. If you if you have a very high risk tolerance and you've got lots of money to play with, and you disperse it to reduce your risk, then sure. I mean, you're going to have day traders out there, people looking at, you know, if I, if this coin doubles in value, I just sell it. And that's my, that's my investment strategy, right? Right. So so that's what I'm going to do is I don't care if it goes up another 10 times after that. I just, there's all different types of investment strategies, but, um, for, for those people that are risk adverse, um, you would probably want to, you know, you know, invest on fundamentals. If you've made a lot in the crypto space and you want to play around and invest, well, I'm sure there are people that are doing that, but it's just very high risk when you've got these cryptos that are a penny or less, as as you mentioned, then they don't really bring anything unique, right? So, right, right. Well, and, and there are exceptions, of course. There, are, you know, a lot of coins and, and things start out. Well, we'll be talking about token coin later in the episode, but our token token card, but like that coin started out with the ICO, and it was roughly. I, I mean, I want to say it was, it, it seemed like it was about 70, 75 cents. Um, well, things haven't really turned out perfectly for, for token cards. So it isn't like the Gnosis, isn't, isn't like a lot of the other ones. And the coin has actually gone out in value. And it, I think it's lower in value now than when you could have picked it up at the ICO. So like, you know, you have a lot of these coins that are starting off at the, the very rock bottom. And they're going to climb up because of the value they bring to the overall user. The, the, the speculating the gambling on a coin to, to increase its value is, is just a short term. Some of these coins like Gnosis, they, they do the computer. You, you, you're paying for computer time with Gnosis, right? No, uh, no, that's Gollum. Gollum. Okay. Well, like, let's say Gollum, right? Um, I personally don't really want to get in on this speculative thing, but if I have a computer that's sitting around that I might be able to devote toward the network and get a few Gollum tokens, that's something I might be willing to do. That's that's another approach that uh, somebody could take. Yeah. So first, wait till there's a viable product, and then provide that service that the token is representing, and then just earn it, and then then you don't have to worry about actually losing money. You're just losing computer time or losing whatever good or service you were giving to the uh, to the market. A few weeks ago, I read a, a Reddit post that kind of you know somebody brought up like an example of what's happening today, and you know just. To paraphrase it, it was, you know, imagine you've been in this crypto space and you've been talking to, you know, people at work and, and friends and they've all dismissed it. Now, all of a sudden, you have your coworker come up to you and say, wow, cryptos and Bitcoin and Ethereum have really risen. I want to get in on this action. I have 10,000. There are a lot, a lot of that's happening today. A lot yeah. of people that are like, wow, you know, I was, you know, I didn't like the way Bitcoin went up and down, but wow, look at all of the money people are making. Look at how much these are going up. I've got 10,000, 15,000. Let me just throw it out there. Right. And that, you know, a, a lot of that is starting to happen is it's getting more attention. You see these articles on Forbes, you see it on Wall Street Journal. It's getting out to the mainstream small investor. And and more and more banks and 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 different institutions are are holding Bitcoin to pay for some of these these ransomware attacks that are happening, which is unfortunate. It's very unfortunate. If the price is going to rise, I don't want that to be the reason. Right. Well, moving on, we have so much more to talk about. Uh, this is a good trader section uh, for talking about speculating and investing and gambling. Most of the time, what you're doing is actually gambling. 
Um, but moving on, talking about listener mail. So Travin Keith is the marketing director and blockchain consultant for the NXT Foundation, and he sent us an email. Well, a few episodes ago, we had a show, and we talked about NXT and Ardor, and there's a few corrections uh, from from Trav- Travin, and uh, I mean, he's, 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 he wasn't a jerk about it or anything, and uh, it was very cool about it, but I do want to get these sort of corrections out there just so that we have a, a better uh, copy yeah, of this so, information. There you go. Um, so, for one, I mispronounced the name of the, the wider company, and it's it's Jelurida. Jelurida is the the company basically that is is now main is is now forward looking maintaining both the NXT and the Ardor uh, soon to be released chain. So, um, the he he talk, he brought up the idea. I, I mentioned the whole fact that I have to keep entering my same uh, passphrase to do anything on it, and it's a rather long burdensome passphrase. And it's it's okay. I don't copy and paste because I I don't think that helps my security. Mm-hmm. But I, I, he mentioned that it would be he, he'd look into possibly if the changing different passwords, like having a different password to do different things, and like you know I think that's one one way. If you had a wallet that was uh, you know you were sharing it as a business, I'd want layers of passwords so that I could as the admin I'd have the head head one, and then my purchasing agent would just have. Um, you know, access to the receiving or, or whatever. And mm-hmm. uh, then my auditor would have access to the transaction history, you know, like different different, different aspects of the wallet. And as, as the wallets do more things, of course, then you can delegate even more to these. But having a different password so that you have one wallet instead of having to sit there and watch the Block Explorer all the time and then trust the, the data sheets you're given from your workers. But anyway... um. And yet he asked if, as of the question, if you can just pay the ardor for yourself. We were talking about how a child chain in the ardor uh, blockchain would um, create a uh, reference point for their blockchain by uh, combining and a bundling a block from their chain with an ardor block. They would have to pay that in the ardor native token. I mean, sorry, in their child token. But the person who does the bundling would pay the ardor token. It's a little complicated, but it's really not that bad. Uh, he said, yes, you could. Uh, pay for that yourself if you're the bundler with the best rate. So that's where the free market comes in, is the bundlers will offer a rate of native tokens and versus the amount of, of their ardor they're going to have to spend to, to make this block. So that's interesting how the market can have some forces there. Uh, on, the, on the podcast, he says, you mentioned that you have an... Ex- oh, yeah, so we have that. And um, So anyway, a couple of uh, things and... And he also wanted to point out one other thing is that the foundation never developed the code, although it was released uh, it was released under in the past for following licensing reasons. Uh, their primary port of contact for businesses interested in using the technology, and they provide some support. So yes, that we the um, what's that 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 other guy that that made it anyway. Check out our, our last episode. We'll have a link to it on the blog. Moving on, talk uh, Pedro. You got a story from for us. Sure. Um, so Shapeshift is moving to smart contracts platform. Uh, so this is at the website prism-launch.com. Uh, Shapeshift announcing details and demo of smart contract powered platform Pr- Prism on May 22nd during Consensus 2017. Um, so let's talk about Consensus 2017. Yeah. So that's running uh, from Saturday uh, through Sunday, May 20th to, through the 21st in uh, 30 Rock- Rockefeller Plaza um, in New York City. Uh, so there's a, a prize for up to five thousand dollars sponsor prizes. So it's a it's a building blocks hackathon. Um, at, con- at consensus, it convenes many of the world's top blockchain developers, uh, vying to build the next killer smart contract app. Participants could build on top of any blockchain protocol, Bitcoin, Ethereum, Hyperledger, or otherwise. And through various sponsor challenges, they're encouraged to leverage the software and support made available by our world-class mem- mentors in order to deliver these solutions. So it's going to be an exciting weekend for uh, crypto in New York City. Right. Uh, Singular is, I, I think it's either the 19th or maybe it's during this consensus thing, but they're going to be uh, announcing the 11 modules of their Singular DTV service. So that, I'm, I'm yeah, really excited to see what that means. That's Friday. Yes, Friday. They're, they're going to be announcing that on Friday. So. Yeah. So um, and maybe, maybe leading up to it, looking at the markets, they're... Snapping up those singles, it's like, it's like, geez, guys, 
Like they've been around for a while. Of course, they're not. This doesn't mean they're doing anything with the singles, and it doesn't mean that you should rush out and snap them up either. But I mean, there's there it, it going back to this trading thing. It just it it baffles me how almost I don't want to say sheep like in a demeaning way, but almost sheep like some of these trading these new trading people are. It just they're very easily led in a direction. I mean, I, I think it's like the dot com bomb. Uh, you know, dot com bust. Yeah. So. Like the dot com, there's tremendous p- potential in the crypto space. I mean, for sure, this is going to change economies and, and the way we live. Um, but not all of these projects are going to succeed, right? Just like in you know the dot com boom, not all of them succeeded, but some of them did. I mean, I right. buy a lot of stuff on Amazon that succeeded. So the the question is, you know, if you're in it for the long haul, you really have to see which one of these projects have good foundation, good white paper, good developers, oh, yeah. reputation. Yeah. Um, if you're just doing it for the day trading, then you know that's a comp- that's like you said, that it's like different. gambling. Yeah. That well, and, and this is why I say teams because I I think it's really just a bunch of them who got to know each other through Poliniex, and then they just hang out some IRC somewhere and they just go, okay, yeah, at this time we're going to pump this one, at this time we're going to pump this one, and it, it's just like fun and games. Uh, what, what what chat can I listen in? On I that? I don't know <laughs> what the actual chat is. I'm 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 merely. A, uh, extrapolating I, I from don't, the data I've seen. Right, I, I don't doubt that's that's happened because there some of these altcoins do have a very very small market cap and small depth, so yeah. it is you know easy to manipulate if you've got. When you look at the history of this altcoin and you see fifteen thousand dollars average volume per day, and all of a sudden it's over a hundred fifty thousand, you should you should think that something. If there's no news, if you search news in this coin and there's no news, there's no big n- announcement, right. no nothing, then there's something fishy going on. Yeah. All right, moving on. Ethereum uh, reaches 50% of Bitcoin's transaction volume. Pedro, this is huge. Yeah, so this is on uh, testnodes.com. So according to data by blockchain.info and Etherscan, Bitcoin is currently hand- handling around 220,000 transactions with a max daily uh, capacity of about 250,000 transactions. Ethereum is now handling 125,000 transactions per day. So, and the fees uh, are really cheap, let me tell you. <laughs> very cheap, like, you know, 1.2 cents. Um, no other currency comes anywhere close. Litecoin, Dash, Monero, and all the rest handle about 400,000 transactions, or at best, 10,000 transactions on a good day, uh, making Ethereum the only digital uh, currency since Bitcoin to handle significant volumes, which currently stand around the same level as Bitcoin's this time last year. Wow. Well, and this is two years old, roughly. Uh, Ethereum going on three years, I think. I, I we'll have to figure out the anniversary date, but um, you know, this this here, it's it just like wow, this root stock is really exciting. Yeah, I mean, I think overall th- there is tremendous amount of of money moving into the crypto space uh, yes. compared to last year. I mean, just since the beginning of this year, I've you know I've seen news and changes and excitement that I I haven't seen in the longest time. Well, and we brought up the, uh, you know, talking about just people at work talking about crypto, <laughs> that subject. We brought up the Bitcoin IRA and the Ethereum IRA. The Ethereum IRA just became offered. But that's another way that money can enter the crypto sphere with, with per, a person really not having anything to do with it. Right, right. Your coworker, that is, you know, the example I gave, all of a sudden is like, wow, this is, I think, something I want to get into. Uh, I have 10000 that I'm going to move from my IRA. Where do I put it in crypto space? And that can, you know, once that starts happening, you get a lot of institutional money that comes after those small investors. So Excellent. Well, talk, talk to us about uh, Enterprise Ethereum Alliance. Yeah, so this was uh, announced. Uh, it's on their website, uh, E-N-T-E-T-H Alliance.org. Uh, So in the weeks following Enterprise Ethereum Alliance formation in late February 2017, uh, we received hundreds of applications for membership from enterprises, startups, academic groups, and offers of support from the growing community of Ethereum specialists and experts. As a result, the Alliance will soon welcome a new cohort of members. Uh, So they talked about a couple of areas where they're they're really looking to uh, drive innovation. So one is building the stack. Uh, they call this the ENT ETH 1.0 reference architecture. So it wants it, it, it wants to accomplish three key objectives. So the first one is configurable consensus, the ability to swap consensus mechanisms depending on the type of environment one, one wants to create. Two is privacy, the ability to have only the desired counterparties and regulator, if necessary, able to see the transaction. And the third is rules-based access control, the ability to have a role assignment, role authorization, and 
permission authorization. So they also talk a little bit about the application layer. So on that topic, they say, we predict that some of the most important work to emerge from the alliance will come from the application layer working groups that have formed since the launch. We currently have active groups working in identity, banking, supply chain. In June, we'll go, uh, we'll go a bit further with working groups that include pharmaceuticals, mobile, and energy companies. Wow. Moving right along. Wow. That's just, uh, it's good stuff. And the, the, I think, you know, we talked, once again, talked about Rootstock, but they are, they are so far behind Ethereum. I mean, Ethereum has a big development team with a lot of people and, and money. I mean, Vitalik, and reputation. I, I mean, they, they have Vitalik. Yeah, Vitalik. I mean, he 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 had his cut from the the whole uh, payout from the initial crowdfunding was basically seven hundred thousand Ethereum, and he's only spent a third of it. So I don't think he's going to be needing money for any time. No, and he soon. Earned, he earned every one of those. I mean, th- this is such a a, a game changer. Um, you know, when I first heard about Ethereum, I. I thought it was almost too ambitious for what they wanted to do, but I've been pleasantly surprised. I certainly did, too. Yeah. I mean, we were very skeptical, and yeah. the fact that they had nothing to show, you know, was just, you know, vapor, vaporware alert. <clears throat> so, well, well, they they were a little bit late, which I expected, yeah. but yeah, but their timeline has been pretty good, I mean, as far as these type projects go. Oh, yeah. I so. see. At this point, if we just look at just Ethereum and the tokens... The amount of, of of money and and flowing through just that avenue of crypto is is huge, absolutely huge. So I think Ethereum will continue to lead the way as far as the smart contract blockchain revolution. And and really, what the Enterprise Ethereum Alliance does, and and just to give you know listeners a little bit of background, but it's a, an alliance of you know companies, both you know public private, that are wanting to investigate how they can use ethereum so uh, a lot of it is on private ethereum so they'd run their own separate yep. ethereum between their data centers for say reconciling stock for example uh but what this what they've come out is said that they will be version compatible with what is on the public because they want to tap into all that talent all that smart contract talent and with big companies getting into this that means there's more jobs for a smart contract um you know coders so i, I think it's really exciting uh, you know, that, that's an infusion of money and, um, you know, capital into this space and is going to really bring out the talent. That's what we need now is that those killer apps on on, on blockchain yeah. type technology. Well, you know, that's you know, we keep hearing that phrase killer app, you know, like and we, we Darren and I, we, we've talked about this before, you know, how, oh, Ethereum is sitting there at four dollars or six dollars or whatever it is. It's just waiting for that killer app to, to come along and sweep it off its feet. You know, right, right. But no, no, and there hasn't been that killer app. But there's been a lot of small apps. That have... There's been a there's been a few small apps certainly, but there's been a lot of tokens. There's been a lot of development. There's been a lot of foundational roots. I think Ether Delta is oh yeah, so an under discussed app or you you're or right. Yeah, so you talked is... about Shapeshift's um trans you're transitioning to a smart contract model, and I've used Ether Delta, and, and if if you two have had yeah, experience. I've used it. So that's smart contract based. Yes, it's a smart contract, and it and it gets around a big problem in the crypto space. So a big problem in the crypto space is that you you usually trade on exchanges, right? And when you trade on an exchange, if the exchange goes away, then your money goes away, right. more or less, and it's hard to sue, and, and you know then you're left with legal challenges, and you know it's two years at least, and that's if you're lucky before you would get any money back. And uh, so what Ether Delta does is it's a contract on the Ethereum chain and you can, you can browse it with your browser, like a web browser, and uh, you can use this MetaMask plugin for Google Chrome and, uh, and interact. Basically, MetaMask keeps track of an, uh, an address that you control and you can interact with the contract through that address Yep, and you can send funds to it. You can send, um, uh, tokens to it, you can to to the contract, and you can trade on this interface on the like the website, and and then you can withdraw. Yep. And it doesn't seem like that's that big a deal because that's a service that's already offered. But what is the big deal is if Ether Delta ever goes away, then those funds are still tied up in that contract. If you can execute the functions in the contract, 
it doesn't matter if the website's up or not, you can recover your funds. Right. So it it's, it gets rid of a big problem, which is called counterparty risk. You, anytime you're trading on exchange, you have the risk that the exchange, which is a counterparty, yes, goes away. Okay. So so you can have counterparty free exchanges, and so that's why I'm a big fan of of uh, trying like the this. There's this Doge Ethereum project, and um, I'm working on a blog entry about a similar thing that I think is kind of scammy, but Doge Ethereum seems like it's a real deal where you can send Doge somewhere on the Doge chain and then the these tokens pop out in Ethereum and then you can redeem the tokens for Doge later if you want. Wow. And so that's that's going to be huge because it's basically a proof of concept. I, it's silly that it's with Doge, but Vitalik says his favorite cryptocurrency is Doge. Yeah. So, um, so I, I think we kind of know what Shapeshift is going to be announcing then. I mean, it's going to be something along the lines of, the, you know, they're going to transition to a smart contract-based exchange. That would just be, I mean, everything would be just well, amazing. Well, and, and then you're, you're not really, see, the, the, the blockchain, the Ethereum blockchain is hosting the exchange at this point. Your viewer, your reader might be some website that interprets the API from that exchange, but ostensibly someone could program a client that could read that same API, much like your wallet uh, interacts with the blockchain itself. So... Uh, it's very exciting stuff. but So we've got one more story about Ethereum, but go ahead. Did you have something? Well, I have a question I want to ask Pedro. Okay. Okay. I'm here. So to me, this is the elephant in the room. So Bitcoin was a great idea, whatever. It works fine. They didn't change the code in time, and they had plenty of, plenty of discussion about it way before it was a problem, and uh, Bitcoin's m- maxed out. Okay, so one thing I noticed, especially after reading this article with... Ethereum ha- handling half of what Bitcoin's handling uh, is I went to just the Explorer on trade block and I, I can see there's a, f- a block that's almost full uh, here and I just pull it up and I- I've been doing this throughout the day and there there happens to be like basically just a one-off block that's about full. Now, the the uh, the equivalent of full in Ethereum is different than the equivalent of full in uh, in Bitcoin because Bitcoin me- full means there's it's oh, uh, it's a megabyte. Uh, in Ethereum, there's a gas limit. And so my question to Pedro, and I think I've looked this up before, but I just want to uh, bring this up, is how how is the gas limit not going to be uh, Ethereum's block size limit? Well, I mean, it, it could be if they don't scale it, but they're, they're talking about in the next month or so uh, releasing the radon um, you know, enhancement to, to Ethereum, which they say will scale to a, a million transactions a second. Would, would that be on the Ethereum chain or would it be something it else? It would be side chain. The side it chain, just side like chain. this root stock. Yeah. Okay. Now, now, even I have a hard time believing a million transactions a second. Oh, but I'm, I do. I'm waiting to be. I have hard time. I mean, I, I think 100,000 100, transactions a second would be the same as Amex, Visa, MasterCard. All the combined together. over, yeah. Yeah, yeah, but now think of it in terms of the Ethereum virtual machine. A transaction is just one more clock cycle, one more computation. It's not someone sending Ethereum to another person. Instead, it's just a contract that needs one more update to its its next procedure. Yeah. So yeah, I could see a million computation. How many does your computer do? I mean, your computer does gigahertz, a, th- a billion but, cycles per but second. But still, a million sidechain transactions per second that then reconcile on a 15-second blockchain is, you know, it, impressive to say the I least. I think, honestly, he's been talking about sharding for a while, and I think the Radon Network might just be a sharded blockchain that is able to, in parallel, create parallel blocks without any sort of um, double spending but then reconcile, as you said, those blocks together as sets uh, later on. So that's just I'm just throwing that out there. I'm just, just pulling it yeah. out of thin air. And, and when I was interested in this problem before, I remember I got a little bit relieved because I believe the gas limit in these Ethereum blocks, I believe it changes. Um, I think there's like a moving the miners, target. The miners can change it themselves. Yeah, I so. think if a miner is including a whole bunch of gas in their block, and this is consistently what happens. I think it's it's programmed so that the gas limit will increase. Well, it would but, have to. I mean, that, it, there would have to be a way to, um, you know, control it from, like, spamming. Yeah. And, and, well, and yeah, and but I, I don't think it's a, a hard limit. I think that uh, it, it kind of adjusts, like, the difficulty. That's when I looked it up before. 
Well, and, um, and honestly, we're we're not even at a full like we are at Ethereum's like yes, you can use the wallet, and you can use the blockchain, but they're not finished building the initial platform yet. No, yeah, and, yep. no, the, the platform is still is still being developed. I mean, there are there are things out there you can use. You can you can gamble on it, right? So sure. Uh, in a lot of jurisdictions, like the United States, you're not supposed to do online gambling uh, unless you live, I guess, in Nevada. Um, but um, <laughs> that's right. So, you, you know, somebody that wants to do that has to get a VPN. They've got a VPN to, a, you know, a server, you know, in another country. Right. But on Ethereum, you can just use a Mist browser or the MetaMask and you can, you know, do, you know, roulette. Mm-hmm. And and the interesting thing about a smart contract that does gambling is you can look at the code. Yeah. So you can see whether or not that's that's fair, whether the odds are what they say they are. Whereas when you log into a private company's server in Barbados to to gamble, yeah, good luck seeing the code. Yeah, you're not going to see the code. You you have to trust that they're you know they say here are your odds. You have to trust them. But you know with with smart contracts, you know if you're smart, you can actually make sure they do. Right. Well, moving on to our last story, of course, since it's Ethereum related, I mean, there's just so much to talk about with that that protocol. Uh, token card talk. So, a token card Reddit AMA with founder Mel Gelderman took place this last Saturday, May 13th. Um, you can still find it on Reddit. Following the successful token generation event, a bug was found that caused a need for a reissuance of tokens. And we talked about this in a few episodes ago. The press picked up the story about the TGE and contacted a Visa representative about the claims made on the token card website. The Visa rep denied that there were any connection between the two. Next thing you know, token card pulls the word Visa from the website and any related media. All of this caused the crypto community to become very skeptical and even cynical about the prospects of the new token card. So, long story short, Mel answered some questions and explained what he could, and it seems that the FUD is not yet warranted. They have an authorized issuing bank in Gibraltar, and the card will debut on one of the credit card networks, either Visa or MasterCard. Um, Visa is the highest probability. Mel also mentioned that there would be a big announcement this week, and that um, the the bank they're using in Germany has this uh, is a pioneer in the remote host authorization situation, where uh, I guess it's easier to to have this bank be your bank when you're not in that bank sort of bank jurisdiction sort of thing. I, I, I don't get this bank stuff, but, um, so basically, yes, the, the, the card is going to, the thing is, is that the token card isn't really going to be, you're not going to see much value until it starts pooling those tokens in that fee pool. Right. Once that happens, then it might go up. But I mean, until then you're, it's sheer speculation that it actually happens. So, that's the situation with Neocash Radio. Thank you, Pedro and Darren, for joining me. And, well, I mean, you guys are part of the show, so I guess I shouldn't really say yeah. it like that. <laughs> well, you're still happy we showed up. Yeah, I'm so happy you showed up here in the studio with Neocash Radio. As always, you can tune in the podcast every Wednesday night. Tune in Neocash Radio at neocashradio.com. Plus, we're also on YouTube, and we, we get some comments on YouTube. It's interesting because I don't see much comments on our blog or, or our lips in account, certainly, or some of the other ones. We don't watch them all, so... If you're commenting at, at one of these different places and you're man- angry that we haven't replied to your comment, it's probably because we don't keep track of that, like, at all. I'm sorry. But uh, we, 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 do, uh, we do have a donation page, and we're updating it um, semi-frequently. But if you want to donate to our show, we really appreciate it. Otherwise, you know, we just do it because we enjoy doing it. Anyways, in the studio with you, it's JJ. Darren. And Pedro. For Neo Cash Radio, where we discuss the future of money today. As always, tune in every Wednesday, neocashradio.com.